Lyra, you haven't been on camera forever. Look. How was your playtime? Was it fun? Did you chase a lot of birds? Um, I'm filming this way today because the sun is shining awkwardly on the sofa, so I hope it's not too busy in the background. Today's video is on radioactivity. I'm going to be talking about alpha, beta, gamma radiation. Just, I'm not going to be talking about half-life, so that's going to have to be another video because there's a lot of calculations involved with that. I'm going to be talking about the different penetrating powers, and I'm going to be talking about the uses of radiation. So hopefully you will find this video really helpful. It's really important when you begin this topic that you understand a lot about the nucleus. So remember the nucleus of an atom became, contains the neutrons and the protons. The protons have a mass of one, neutrons have a mass of one, and then the other atomic particles you need to know about are the electrons, and they obviously exist in the shells surrounding the nucleus, and they have a very tiny mass. The number is actually one divided by 1,840, but it's very, very small. So remember, the mass number of an atom is found by adding together the protons and the neutrons. It's also important that you know the definition of the word isotope. Isotopes are atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So that means you have, for example, carbon-12, carbon-14. They are both um, they are both carbon because they have an atomic number of six. I hope it's six, I think it is, if I remember rightly. But they have different mass numbers. One has a mass number of 12, the other one has a mass number of 14, which tells you that it has two extra neutrons. I think we can get straight into it now. Remember that the reason why an atom is radioactive is because there are too many neutrons in the nucleus, which renders it unstable, and it's likely that this unstable nucleus will emit radiation in order to help it become stable, and it will emit different types of radiation. It will either be alpha, beta, or gamma. Starting with alpha radiation, what you find is that when a nucleus emits alpha radiation, it emits a helium nucleus. That's to say that it emits two neutrons and two protons. That therefore means that when you're writing the radi radioactivity equations, what you need to do is you need to take four off of the mass number to find your element's new mass number, and you need to take two off the atomic number, because remember, the atomic number and the proton number are the same. And I'm actually going to insert some examples here. You'll be given the name of the element or the symbol and its mass number and atomic number, and you're going to have to work out how that changes when it emits an alpha particle. I just told you that an alpha particle is made up of two protons and two neutrons. Each proton has a mass of one, each neutron has a mass of one. So if you lose two protons and two neutrons, you find that the mass number will go down by four. And remember, the mass number is the top number here. And then the proton number, because two have been lost, remember the proton number is the same as the atomic number, so the atomic number, which is the bottom number, will have gone down by two. So that's 88, and this element will now be a new element, because obviously the atomic number's changed, and it's radon. And then you complete it by writing the alpha and mass and proton number there. And remember, alpha is a helium nucleus. Next up is if you have beta radiation. Now this time, a neutron turns into a proton and emits an electron, which is actually the beta particle. So when we're looking at the equation, what you find is the mass number actually stays the same. Why is that? Well, at the beginning, I told you that the protons and the neutrons both have a mass of one. So if a neutron turns into a proton, the mass stays the same. However, because you've now gained an extra proton, you will find that the atomic number, the proton number of the element, will have increased by one. So that's what you need to do in a beta decay equation. Now I'm going to talk you through beta decay, and we have potassium here. So potassium has a mass number of 40, it has an atomic or a proton number of 19. Remember, in beta decay, the neutron turns into a proton. So what you'll find is that the mass number will stay the same because they both have the same mass. However, because a proton has been gained, it means that the atomic number will go up by one. So you find that the mass stays at 40, the atomic number goes up by one to become 20. Because we have a new atomic number, we have a new element, and it will actually be calcium. And then I'm just going to finish off by writing the beta particle here. Okay, lastly, gamma radiation. Gamma is very different from alpha and beta decay. It is a wave, it's a member of the electromagnetic spectrum. Check out my video on that if you're less certain of that topic. But remember, it's a very high frequency wave, full of energy, and therefore, when you emit gamma radiation, neither the mass number or the proton number will change. Okay, you need to know now about the varying um, penetrating powers and ionizing powers of those three types of radiation. First of all, remember what an ion is. An ion is a charged particle. It's an atom which has either lost or gained electrons. 
So the more ionising the radiation, the more likely it is to cause an atom to gain or lose electrons. Alpha radiation is the most ionising. Beta is moderately ionising. Gamma is not very ionising at all. Okay, it's weakly ionising. That means the type of radiation you least want to enter your body is alpha because what it will do is it will cause lots of issues because it will cause mutations to happen to your cells which could lead to cancer and a tumour developing. In terms of penetrating power, what we mean by that is how far the type of radiation travels before it is stopped. Now alpha will only travel a few centimetres in air before it's stopped which is why it's not very dangerous to have an alpha source near you because actually it's never actually going to reach you to cause you to have a mutation to cause you to have cancer. So alpha radiation isn't dangerous outside the body but it's very dangerous inside the body because it's very ionising. Beta, like before, when we were talking about its ionising powers, this time it's moderately penetrating, so the way we stop that is using aluminium. Gamma is very penetrating and can actually only be stopped by several centimetres thick of lead sheeting or a metre thickness of concrete, so gamma is very dangerous outside the body because it finds it very easy to reach us and therefore cause mutations, so you definitely don't want to come into too much contact with a gamma radiating source. Oh, this video is going very well, I'm happy. So lastly I need to talk about the various uses of these various types of radiation. Um, there's quite a few uses, things like smoke alarms, tracers, carbon, rock, carbon dating, um, checking to see if there's leaks. So I'm going to take each one in turn and try and give you a whistle stop tour of all the uses. Let's start with the smoke alarm. Okay, what happens here is in your smoke alarm you have a small alpha source, so it's emitting alpha radiation. What happens is the alpha radiation meets air particles and what that does is it creates a small electric current which is picked up by a detector in the smoke alarm. So when everything's nice, there's no smoke, there's no fire, you'll find that this current is reaching the detector, so the detector's happy so it's not going off. However, when there's a fire there's lots of smoke and soot in the air, so actually what happens is it blocks the alpha particles and we know that they don't travel very far. So the smoke particles get in the way of the alpha radiation, therefore no ionisation of air particles can happen, so there's no electric current. So the detector is like, hey, there's no current, and therefore it knows that there's a fire, hence the alarm will sound. So it's actually really clever. The second use I'm going to talk about is making paper and aluminium foil the right thickness. This time we're talking about beta radiation, and all that happens is you have a couple of rollers which roll the aluminium or paper out to the right thickness, and then there's a detector and a beta source. So the beta source is sending through beta particles, Next up we're going to talk about tracers. Now these are special chemicals we add to our bodies to work out if there's anything wrong with them. So you, a doctor might think there's something wrong with your kidneys. So what they do is they'll give you a dose of iodine. And what that does is it travels around the body. When it gets to the kidney, you can, it will pass through it or it won't pass through. And the doctor can get a scan to show whether it's passed through or if there's a blockage. So it's a really good way of identifying if there's any problems with various parts of your body. Now the reason why they use iodine is because it has a short half-life, remember I'm going to film a video on half-lives, but that's a good thing because it only has a half-life of seven days, which is good because you don't want all of this radioactive iodine staying in your body, potentially causing you harm. However, seven days is long enough for you to actually have a scan, so it's the perfect length of time. Second point is that it produces a stable isotope, which again is really important because the last thing you want is an unstable isotope in your body emitting radiation. They use gamma radiation for detecting leaks in water pipes. What they do is they add a gamma source to the water that flows through the pipes under the ground. There's a detector above the ground which is detecting how much gamma radiation there is in the water. If it suddenly detects a lot of radiation it tells you that there's a leak above the pipe because it means that the water is escaping up into the ground and therefore a far larger reading is received. Um, lastly, I think I just want to talk about carbon dating. So we use carbon dating to detect how to determine how old a sample of plant material is. Remember plants use carbon to grow, they use it in photosynthesis in the form of carbon dioxide. Now some of the carbon they'll take in will be radioactive and obviously that will decay over time. However, when they die, they can't take in any more carbon because they're dead. So if you compare the amount of carbon that they have now compared with when they were alive, you can definitely see how old they are. So that's everything I really wanted to talk about. I'm going to talk about Half-Life in another video. I hope you found it helpful and I'm really happy I'm on a bit of a roll with these videos because hopefully I'll be back soon with another video. Don't forget to subscribe, it makes me really happy and leave me any comments below. So see you soon, bye! Question 2a. A teacher used a Geiger-Muller tube and counter to measure the background radiation in her laboratory. 
The teacher reset the counter to zero, waited one minute, then took the count reading. The teacher repeated the procedure two more times. 2A part one. Background radiation can be either from natural sources or from man-made sources. Name one man-made source of background radiation. Okay, crucial thing here is that it needs to be man-made, so anything like x-rays from an x-ray machine or from nuclear waste is a sensible answer here. If it had asked for a natural source, you should have written something like cosmic rays or radioactive rocks. 2A part 2. The three readings taken by the teacher are given in the table. Count after 1 minute, 15, 24, 18. The readings given, given in the table are correct. Why are the readings different? And the reason you need to write here is because radioactive decay is a random process, so you never know when the nucleus is actually going to decay, but literally just write decay as a random process and you will get the mark. 2B. Some scientists say they have found evidence to show that people living in areas of high natural background radiation are less likely to develop cancer than people living in similar areas with lower background radiation. The evidence these scientists found does not definitely mean that the level of background radiation determines whether a person will develop cancer. So just a reason why, oh, well, there's loads of other factors that could be involved. Um, and obviously we've got, oh, sorry, that's my phone. We've got insufficient evidence. So just provide any of those two reasons and you'll get the mark. 2C, an atom of isotope radon 222 emits an alpha particle and decays into an atom of polonium. An alpha particle is the same as a helium nucleus. Thank you, AQO. The symbol below represents an alpha particle. Sorry. How many protons and how many neutrons are there in an alpha particle? Okay, well, the answer is, and they've actually shown you here, really, the answer by giving you the helium nuclei, but you should also have known this from your revision. But the answer is 2, because remember, the bottom number is the atomic number, which is the same as the proton number. And the number of neutrons is the difference between the mass number, which is 4, and the proton number, which is 2. So you take 2 from 4 to get 2. So the answer for both is 2. 2C part 2. The decay of radon 222 can be represented by the equation below. Complete the equation by writing the correct number in each of the two boxes. Okay, let's take the first box. Like I said, the top number is the mass number. If you've lost two protons and two neutrons, then you will have lost a total of four from the mass number because each of those particles has a mass of one. So the top number will therefore become 218. And then because you've lost two protons, and remember that's the same as the bottom number, which is the atomic number, the bottom number will now be 84. 2D. The graph shows how, in a sample of air, the number of radon-222 nuclei changes with time. Use the graph to find the half-life of radon-222. Show clearly on the graph how you obtain your answer. Okay, well, because it's telling you to basically draw on the graph, make sure you do, otherwise you won't get that second mark. And you need to draw a horizontal line across from 400, because that's when half of the nuclei have decayed, and then read down on the y... Oh no, I'm saying it wrong! <laughs> you need to read across on the y-axis at 400, and then where that meets the line, bring a line down to the x-axis, and you'll see that the time in days is 3.8. Sorry! Okay, let's find another question. Question 5. In 2011, an earthquake caused severe damage to a nuclear power station in Japan. The damage led to the release of large amounts of radioactive iodine-131, into the atmosphere, the table gives some information, complete the table, okay, mass number 131, number of protons 53, remember to calculate the number of neutrons, you need to take the number of protons away from the mass number, so 131, take 53, gives you 78 neutrons. 5b, complete the sentence, the number of protons in the atom is called the proton number or the, okay, again, you need to just have learned that and that is the atomic number. 5C, an atom of iodine-131 decays into an atom of xenon by emitting a beta particle. The decay of iodine-131 can be represented by the equation below. Complete the equation by writing the correct number in each of the two boxes. Right, so in beta decay, remember that a neutron changes into a proton. However, they both have a mass of 1. So you will find that the mass is unchanged, so the top number, which is the mass number, needs to stay. So that's 131. But then the atomic number, which is the proton number, needs to go up by 1 because 1 proton has been gained, so the bottom number is 54. 5C part 2. A sample of rainwater contaminated with iodine 131 gives a count rate of 1,200 counts per second. Calculate how many days it will take for the count rate from the sample of rainwater to 4 to 75 counts per second. Half-life is 8 days. Okay, I like this question. What you have to do is work out how many half-lives have passed to get from 1,200 counts to 75. So literally, trial and error. Plug 1,200 into your calculator and then times it by a half till you get to 75. It will take four half-lives to get to 75 counts per second and then simply multiply 
the time taken for one half-life, which is eight days, by four to get your answer. So the answer is 32 days. 5C part three. If people drink water contaminated with iodine-131, the iodine-131 builds up in the thyroid gland. This continues until the thyroid is saturated and cannot absorb any more. The radiation admitted could cause cancer of the thyroid. In Japan, people are likely to be drinking water contaminated with iodine-131 were advised to take tablets containing a non-radioactive isotope of iodine. So just why this is, advice was given. This is a kind of common sense question, but you could have said something like, well, that would limit the amount of um, radioactive iodine that could be absorbed and therefore decrease the risk of cancer. Okay, I hope you found the questions added on to the end of this video helpful. And yeah, I'll see you soon. Bye.